would go down in our grief, down to the creek, away from everybody, and wail and sing songs of our people. Wailing the loss of everything, family, land, language. I was born in 1931, up in the northwest corner of South Australia, in the Everard Ranges. My community there is called Mimali, but I lived in a place called Waldariaka. One day, father decided he would go west on a trading trip. So mother thought that he would go walk about to Bernabella, or as the people call it, Pukaja. That was a long, long way away. And so we walked about two or three days. Very tired, hot. So us kids jumped into the creek where there was a beautiful spring. But then the next morning, it was like all hell broke loose. Police came riding in. All the men were away on ceremony. They just rounded us up. Three of my family, my sisters and our three cousins. My mother made a quick decision to jump on the back of the mail truck. We went from cattle station to cattle station to the, the rail head, which was Udna Data. There was one missionary lady, Miss Amory. She made us welcome, but she didn't make mother welcome. She would turn mother away. I didn't find out until many years later that she had to walk with her grief in the darkness about 10, 10 miles away to what they called the native camp. I said, why, why didn't she allow mother to have one night with us? We'd been used to sleeping in a grass hut. If I woke up in the night, I could look up and see the stars. They're like diamonds in the desert. It was a very terrifying night to be stuck in four walls. We'd always slept on the ground with the warmth of each other. And uh, so this was very terrifying to be in beds off the ground. Of course, we got up in the, in the morning and had strange food, porridge. We'd never had porridge before because we'd been used to bush tucker. So it was all very strange. Everything was strange. Why did this strange woman have to care for us when we had our own mother? trying to make sense of what really doesn't make sense. So the next morning I determined that I'd take my little cousin by the hand. She was four. Grace her name was, but in our language we called her Kunja. We started running as we thought back. And then we came to the railway line We'd never seen a train in our lives before and we thought it was the devil in itself and we were calling out Mamu, Mamu and running for the mission house. But that was God's way of protecting us, I believe, that uh, we would have perished. We would never have found our way home. Besides, it was the hottest time of the year. Anyway, after about a month, we had to get inside that devil and travel down to Quorn, when we got out to Colbrook and all along the fences, all these kids, <laughs> so many kids, because they wanted to see their new members of their family. Because it was a faith mission, the first thing we had to do was learn Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From the midst of my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So one evening, I was standing alone watching the sun go down over the Flinders Ranges. And I was bawling my eyes out. And then God came to me, Psalm 121. I never slumber nor sleep. 
Just this I'll watch over Israel, I'll watch over you. So you can understand why I love the Lord so much. When we started school, found out that the teacher, teachers were wonderful really. They were really, really wonderful. And help us to fit in and um, learn this new strange language. 30 plus kids. Half of the family went to the Methodist and the rest of us went to the Salvation Army. That's where I made um, a decision on Easter Sunday when I was 11 years of age. I gave my heart to the Lord when I said, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. We had a wonderful life, really. It was just the fact that we were separated from everything that meant so much to us. You have to fit in, you have to adjust. And so that's what we did. In 1943, there was a big drought up in that area. The missionaries decided that we'd go to Adelaide for a break. And the people in Eden Hills, they didn't want black kids at school with their kids, so the government gave us one teacher school. And she was a very lovely lady. And we had a beautiful choir. In 1946 or 47, I went out to work. And I worked for a doctor, they were a Christian family, until my cousin, she became a matron of a small country town. She asked me to go up there because it was so racist in that day. We were not accepted in the hospitals or teaching or anything. We were expected to be maids and boys were expected to be stockmen. And so by stipulation of the government, we could only stay one year in each country hospital. I became a senior nurse there. Then I went to another hospital, a private hospital this time, in a place called Norwood, one of the suburbs of Adelaide. Just loved it there. I asked the theatre sister to come into the Adelaide Town Hall because the Aborigines Advancement League told the people of South Australia our story. Aboriginal people and white people working together for reconciliation. To be given the same opportunity as every other child that left school. It was all together a very successful night because the media was there as well and so the story was told. So we felt very happy that things were going to change. We got uh, calls from the Methodist Hospital, Memorial Hospital, and the Presbyterian Hospital in Wakefield Street. But we thought we've come this far. We have to go to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, the top teaching school. So I decided I wouldn't go in the first enclave, so I went to Bible College instead. Because I wanted to know that my heart was right before God, that I would treat, treat people without any discrimination. And so I decided I would go apply to the Royal Adelaide. So I was a registered nurse and then I became a midwife. And eight of us went to Tasmania to pick apples. There were three orchards, uh, three Norwegian brothers. And so I was in the, the older brother, Harry Hansen's group. And my husband-to-be was in Oscars. So I met, I met Bink there. Yeah, we got married and then we went to Sweden in 1961. So that was another lifestyle, learning of another language again. So Bank said, you've seen my family and now I need to see your family. We went up to Mimili and of course there was so much wailing. 32 years, my mother thought I was dead. Because you see the missionaries had changed my name to Muriel. The grief, you know, and uh, so my mother was still living in a grass hut, but I never did see my father again. Forty-nine intercessors from England came out to Australia to repent of the way their ancestors had settled this land. They brought hope. These beautiful people who came out in true repentance. I think it was in La Perouse, this old man said, I never thought I would live to see the day when a white man would say they were truly sorry and weep for what had happened and for our dispossession. And, but there's power in forgiveness, there's healing in forgiveness, not only for people but for the land. I found Jesus when I was young. 
I think that's the most important decision I ever made in my life. And I learned how to forgive because he'd shown us that, hadn't he? He showed us that very clearly when he was on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's not just religious words. It's a reality of my experience. I had this song that meant a lot to me. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long.